It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Stephen, for inviting me to come. I work at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Massachusetts. I'm a senior plan consultant. And what I do throughout the year is give sales seminars for Blue Cross for people who go on to Medicare and they want to buy Medicare-related plans. That's not what we're doing here today. We're doing an educational talk called Planning for Medicare Countdown to 65, and you all have a handout that we're going to go through. Um, if, so I'm not talking about Blue Cross plans here today, but if you ever want that information, you can just call our company or we also have a website with all of our, our plan information. My goal here today is to give you some high level information about how Medicare works and how the plans work when people go onto Medicare because you know we work all our lives and we have health insurance through our employer and we have those nice human resource people who answer our questions and then one day we're on our own and we're on Medicare and we're trying to figure all this out. Now I have talked to a few people here who have who, who will have at some point um, retiree coverage through their employer and you see this sometimes when people work for the federal government, postal workers, people who work for municipalities, sometimes you get a plan that you keep as part of your retiree benefits and that's a good thing. Um, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about group coverage but many of the group plans work the same way as the individual plans. I'm trying to explain to you what is out there when you go on to Medicare and you have to buy your own coverage. You don't have a group plan. We have so two sections that we're going to go through. We have section one, which is Medicare and Medicare related options. And this makes up the larger part of the presentation and we find that most people come to hear this information. We do have a short section at the end called options meaning health plan options if you retire before you're eligible for Medicare, which is typically age 65. We've added this in because we were going out there a few years ago talking about Medicare and then we were always running into somebody who said, oh, well, my spouse is five years younger than I am. I'm going on to Medicare, but she's not. So we wanted to give some information about that person's situation as well. Section one, Medicare and Medicare related options. So when someone goes on to Medicare, and I'm going to give you that information next, but when someone has Medicare and they want to buy more coverage today, they have two ways of doing this. And this slide really visually, visually lays out those two uh, avenues, if you will, that you can go down to buy more coverage. So your starting point is to have original Medicare. That's that puzzle piece up at the top left. We'll talk about that in a sec. Once someone has Medicare, if they want more coverage than just Medicare, they can buy other plans from private companies, and there are different types of plans they can buy. One type of plan is known as a Medigap plan. You add that onto Medicare, and the job of this plan is to pay after Medicare. Then that person would probably buy a prescription drug plan, which is known as Medicare Part D. Um, that's how people get drug coverage today when they're on Medicare. So this whole uh, left side of the slide, those three individual boxes, you can think of those as three insurance cards in, in your wallet. When someone does this, many people do, it's more, I guess, the traditional way of using Medicare, they have original Medicare as their primary coverage, they bought a Medigap plan to pay after Medicare, and they have a standalone prescription drug plan. So that's one way to go. Over here on the right, there's a bigger box, and in it, it says Medicare Advantage plan. This is another type of plan that you can buy when you have Medicare. Sometimes these are called Medicare Part C, you might have heard of that, Medicare Advantage plans are sold usually as HMO or PPO type plans, and I'm going to give you more details on this. When you buy a Medicare Advantage plan, this plan takes over and pays instead of Medicare. So these other plans pay separately. The Medicare Advantage plan takes over and replaces Medicare and pays for your medical claims in the place of Medicare. 
The Advantage plan can also give you extra benefits and you, may, you might find Part D drug coverage built right into this plan. So this is kind of an all-in-one plan. So today people either do what's on the left or they do what's on the right. And every year there's an open enrollment period I'll tell you about and you can change your, your options. Original Medicare. This is, I'm gonna do this quickly, but we think it's really important that people understand Medicare in order to understand the plans that they're gonna buy that are going to work together with Medicare. So what is Original Medicare? This is health insurance provided by the federal government. There are two parts to it. There's Medicare Part A that is paying for inpatient type coverage, and that's free for most people. There's Medicare Part B that is paying for outpatient services and everything that we have done today with um, doctors. So Part B is not free. A is free, B is not. B has a monthly premium, and the federal government sets this premium, and they change it every year, usually. This year, the standard Part B premium for anybody going on to Medicare in 2016 is $121.80 per month. People who fall into high income brackets might be asked to pay more. Social Security would let you know, and I have a slide later to show you on that. Um, people who had, has anybody here have had Medicare already since last year? Okay, no one. Anybody who had Medicare? Okay, anybody who had Medicare Part B last year as of 2015, you were probably paying 104.90 for Medicare Part B. That did not increase this year for people who were already on Medicare and paying that Part B premium out of their Social Security check. You didn't get a rate, you didn't get an increase, I should say. But people new this year are paying 121.80. And then in 2017, we'll have to see. The federal government announces what Part B will be every year in the fall. So how does it work? When you have original Medicare, you can see any provider that's part of Medicare. And this is national coverage. Medicare providers, doctors, hospitals, they're all over the United States and US territories. You don't need referrals. It's not managed care. But there are deductibles and coinsurances with original Medicare, and I'll show you that in a couple of slides. So this was enacted in 1965, original Medicare, under Lyndon Johnson's administration. It was meant to provide people with core benefits. Medicare was never meant to be 100% coverage, so that's why people buy other insurance. So at some point, we're all going to be enrolling onto Medicare. We do this through Social Security. That's the agency that we work with. And people are eligible for Medicare in two ways. Either you're turning 65, your birthday makes you Medicare eligible, your coverage would start on the first of your birthday month. So let's say you're born on June 10th, your Medicare takes effect June 1st. Some people are covered under Medicare who are younger than age 65 because of a disability and after two years or on the 25th month of that disability, they might be entitled to Medicare benefits. Now, the first time you go onto Medicare is called your initial election period. It's a, it's a very uh, formal period of time that Medicare recognizes around your birthday month. So let's say uh, your June 10th is your birthday, your Medicare starts June 1st, your initial election period would begin three months prior to the month that Medicare takes effect. So in that case, it would be March, March, April, May, June's your birthday, and then it lasts for three months after, so July, August, September. That window of time is when you can contact Social Security and sign up for Medicare. You can also go and look at the plans that are out there that the insurance companies sell and you can buy one of those plans as well during your initial election period. When someone is already collecting Social Security and they turn 65, they probably are not gonna to have to contact Social Security. The card's just gonna come in the mail. That's what people tell me. I didn't do anything, the card just came in the mail. So you will be mailed your Medicare card. If you're turning 65 and you're not collecting Social Security, 
it might not be so automatic. You can still have your benefits start, but you might need to prompt Social Security. You can call them up. You can go onto their website, which is also in this PowerPoint, ssa.gov. And many people today still like to go down to a Social Security office and sit down with an agent. You can do that too. So you can start your Medicare benefits. Continuing to work past age 65. We find today that many, many people are doing this, that people are working longer. And if you plan to work beyond your 65th birthday, you should still contact Social Security and let them know your plans, let them know what you're doing. They may enroll you in Medicare Part A. That's fine, Part A is premium free. They'll send you a card. You're, if you keep working, your active employer coverage is still going to be your primary coverage. So you can delay signing up for Medicare Part B beyond age 65 with no penalty as long as you have group insurance from your employer for whom you're actively working or your spouse has group insurance from their employer where they're working and you're a covered dependent. So the key to no penalty for Medicare Part B is active employer coverage. Um, if the company that you work for or that your spouse works for has less than 20 employees, you should check with the benefits office to make sure you can stay on, to, on Medicare. But if the company's larger, more than 20 employees, by law, uh, they have to offer everyone the active employer coverage. So you can keep that. You should talk to Social Security. You can delay Part B and not pay that $121.80 a month while you have that employer coverage. Now, this is, these are general guidelines that I'm giving you. Anybody who has a unique situation, I always recommend that you talk to Social Security. Can you enroll onto Medicare online? And yes, I believe you can do it on Social, so Social Security's website, which is ssa.gov. What I want to show you here are the cost sharing um, figures for 2016. I'm not trying to scare anybody with this information. If you buy other insurance, you probably won't have to concern yourself with these cost sharing amounts, but you still should know what they are. So if someone just has original Medicare this year in 2016, A and B of Medicare, they have no other coverage, uh, this is what we're gonna look at. So this slide goes over Part A coverage. That's the inpatient coverage. So up at the top, inpatient hospital. Let's say someone goes into a hospital this year and they have an admission and they're in that hospital between one and 60 days. Medicare covers them, but there is a Part A hospital deductible they're responsible for. It's $1,288 this year. So let's say I go into the hospital and I have knee surgery. I'm there for three days. Medicare's covering me, but that hospital sent me a bill at home for $1,288. This runs on something called a benefit period, which begins the day you go into the hospital. It ends when you've been home for 60 days or more. So if I go home for more than 60 days and I go back into the hospital for some reason, according to Medicare, I'm in a new benefit period and I start on coverage day one again, I pay another deductible. So that's how Part A works. Every time you're in and out of a facility, if there's more than 60 days that you've been home, you start all over again. Now, most people are just concerned for, for that deductible because hospital stays today are not that long. They're not more than 60 days usually. But uh, sometimes people have catastrophic events. If you were still in the hospital from day 61 to 90, Medicare would ask you to start contributing $322 a day. From day 91 to 150, Medicare is asking you to contribute $644 a day. These last days, you see where it says their lifetime reserve? You see that? Day 91 to 150 is those covered hospital days you only get once in your lifetime as a Medicare beneficiary. So it's unusual that someone would have more than one catastrophic event. But if you did, you'd have 150 days of hospital coverage the first time, and then 
the next time, if you had a catastrophic event, you'd have to be home for 60 days or more. You start all over at coverage day one. Then you're only covered up to 90 days. So after this inpatient hospital coverage ends in that benefit period, sometimes people go to skilled nursing. They go for some rehabilitative care. And Medicare covers the first 20 days in a skilled nursing facility after a three-day hospital, hospital admission. So once you've been in the hospital three days, if you go to rehab or skilled nursing, Medicare pays those first 20 days 100%. After that, from day 21 to 100, they're covering you, Medicare covers, but you're contributing 161 per day, $161 per day. And there are 100 days of skilled nursing each benefit period. So part B is covering the services that we have most often. So office visits and specialist visits, physical therapy, lab work, x-rays, MRIs, everything outpatient. That would include an ambulance ride or an outpatient surgery. All that is under Part B. There are now certain preventive services that Medicare covers 100% as well. Um, and these you can find on Medicare's website. Uh, at some point you might be getting at home sent to you a Medicare and you handbook. That's all in there. So I'll name a couple yearly wellness visits, annual mammograms, annual PSA screenings, you don't contribute towards those. But everything else under Part B, this is how it works. You go for those services in the beginning of the year that are not preventive. Maybe you go to the doctor in January and you think you have the flu. And they do an office visit, some lab work, you have a chest x-ray. All those claims go into Medicare. You will be responsible for the first $166 this year. That is a Part B calendar year deductible. And remember, these figures change every year. The government sets these. So this year, Part B's deductible is $166. So you'll pay that. Then, for the rest of the year, the way Part B works is it's like an old-fashioned indemnity plan. It pays 80%, and you're responsible for 20% of the services that you have for the rest of the year. This 20% is based on a Medicare negotiated rate. So doctors that are part of Medicare, that they're contracted with Medicare, they agree to accept Medicare's um, contracted rate as their final payment. And Medicare's gonna pay 80% of that amount, and you're gonna pay 20%. So your 20% is of an adjusted amount. It's not the full charge. Example, okay. So I, I started one and then I stopped. So you think you have the flu, you go in for an office visit, they draw some blood, you go for a chest x-ray, all those claims go into Medicare. Medicare is gonna process those claims and pay your doctor. But Medicare is gonna withhold $166 and say, Dr. So-and-so, bill your patient. So that 166 will come from your doctor's office. And then after that, for the rest of the year, 20% will come to your house as your responsibility. And remember, this is if you have not purchased other insurance. So the 20%. Pick up the other costs, correct? Yeah, so the question is, will other insurance pick up these costs? And yes, um, the other insurance will. It'll either pay these direct Medicare balances, and that's what we'll talk about with many GAP plans, or if you buy an Advantage plan, it pays differently. So when you go in for those office services, you might pay a $30 copayment or a $20 copayment, and that's it. Now, there are certain services original Medicare does not cover, uh, care outside of the United States. The plans that you buy usually add in worldwide coverage but Medicare doesn't cover you out of the country. Routine vision services. What do I mean by routine? This is really where you're reading that eye chart, you know, with the letters and they get smaller. That's a routine eye exam. Medicare doesn't pay for that. If you go to see an ophthalmologist for eye conditions, Medicare certainly covers that. Original Medicare also does not cover routine hearing exams. So that's just like a baseline preventive test. Also routine dental, so cleanings, fillings, white wing x-rays, those things are not covered by Medicare. 
Original Medicare A and B does not cover outpatient prescription drugs. Now, if you're in a hospital and you're being given medications, Original Medicare will cover that. Sometimes people have medications that are administered. So for example, injectable type medications. Someone might go to an outpatient setting to have infusions and things like that. Original Medicare covers that. An outpatient drug is where your doctor writes a prescription and hands it to you. And you have to go down to your local pharmacy. You're, we're gonna talk about Part D plans that cover those. So you need Part D to cover that. So you know how I told you when I talked about skilled nursing that you have 20 days covered by Medicare Part A after a three-day admission? Well, original Medicare covers skilled nursing after you've been inpatient. There's a lot in the news today about the fact that some people are going to the hospital and they're actually never admitted. They might go in through the emergency room, and they might even stay overnight, and they're there in a, a way that they call observation. So if somebody goes into the hospital and they're under observation, they've never been admitted, or that overnight was less than three days and it wasn't formally inpatient, they don't have it, a skilled nursing benefit. This actually happened to my neighbor. I live in Medford. My neighbor fell, he's an 80 plus gentleman, and he fell about a year ago and he went to a local hospital and they sent him after observation to a rehab, and he got a $5,000 bill. So, what I am hearing on Beacon Hill, the Office of Elder Affairs, all the advocates, is that there, I, I believe there's some legislation that has been filed to try and have Medicare take a look at that three-day admission requirement and maybe change it. But what I hear them telling people is, if you go to the hospital for any reason, and they start talking to you about going to a skilled nursing or a rehab facility, then, then you want to start asking questions about what your status is in that hospital. Am I, am I admitted? How, am I un here under observation? If you want me to go to rehab, I want to be admitted? That type of thing. And that's, that's as much as I can say at this point. So one type of plan you can buy when you have Medicare, if you don't want to worry, if you don't want to think or worry, I guess, about those expenses that we discussed, you can buy a plan known as a Medigap plan. It's also called a Medicare supplement. So if you hear those terms, if someone says, oh, I have a supplement, or if someone says, I have a Medigap plan, they have the same thing. It's the same type of plan. It's secondary insurance. It's added on to Medicare, so you still have to have Medicare A and B. That means you have to keep paying that Part B, that 121.80, and then you're gonna pay a premium for your Medigap plan. But the job of this plan is to follow along and just pay those Medicare balances. Um, you have to show both of your insurance cards when you go to see your providers. So you go to the doctor's office, show both your Medicare and your Medigap card. They're billing both carriers. So Medicare pays first. That means you have preserved all of that flexibility of seeing Medicare providers anywhere in the US. So Medicare pays first. And then the balance goes directly to the Medigap plan. You should not have to handle claim forms or do any of that work. That should work itself out between the two plans. Medigap plans, and now we're looking at a chart. We like charts at Blue Cross and Blue Shield. <laughs> so on this chart, on the left, those are the out-of-pocket costs of Medicare that we just talked about. And now you see, moving over to the right, there's a column for something called Supplement Core. There's a column for Supplement 1. So there are, there are quite a few, four or five, maybe even six plans, private plans out there selling Medigap plans. But we are all regulated by the Massachusetts Division of Insurance, and this the state calls these plans Supplement Core and Supplement One. That's the generic term that's used. Then these benefits are regulated by Massachusetts. So now, um, look at the columns for the supplements and where there's a check mark, that means that you're covered between Medicare and that Medigap plan 100%. So I'll talk about Supplement One first, all the way over to the right. Supplement One plans, um, 
they cover everything after Medicare Part A and B 100%. So Medicare pays first, the balance goes to Supplement 1, Supplement 1 picks up that balance, and that's the end of it. No bills coming to your house, no additional co-payments or cost sharing. Now, these plans, there are, I think, five carriers out there. There's a range of premiums. Not all carrier has the same price. And the range right now is somewhere between about 180 to about 220 per month. So that's the amount per member per month. And remember, you're still paying for Part B. So from a monthly perspective, that can be kind of high for some people for their budget. But what's predictable are the out-of-pocket costs for your services because there aren't any. This is per person. This is per person. Medicare benefits are individual benefits. When you're on your own buying your own Medicare plan, you're buying an individual plan because Medicare benefits are individual. Now the supplement core, that's another option that people have and this is a really good option for a lot of people. It's about half the cost. So the core plans range between about 93 and about 110 or $115 per member per month. The biggest difference between the core and the supplement one is in the part A or the inpatient type coverage. So looking at that chart, you see right up at the top where it says that part A hospital deductible, 1,288, there's no check mark next to the core. So if I go in the hospital and have that knee surgery, I'm still paying that 1,288. If I bought the supplement one plan, it would pay it for me. After that deductible, if, if uh, someone gets into a catastrophic type event, day 61 to 150, both plans are paying those daily charges, the 322 a day or the 644 a day. So that's really like a catastrophic level of coverage. Moving down the chart, Part A skilled nursing. Medicare, remember, pays that first 20 days. From day 21 to 100, the core will not pay the 161 a day. The supplement one plans do. Part B, the calendar year deductible. This is, the, this is the, really the, the, the biggest difference on the outpatient side is the core doesn't pay the 166, the supplement one does. If you're fortunate enough to have a good medical year, you're always outpatient. The only difference between the core and the one really is that $166. After that, the core plans and the Supplement 1 plans for the rest of the year pick up all, all the 20% balances. Neither program is covering outpatient prescription drugs because Medicare A and B doesn't. So we're going to talk next about Part D coverage. Down at the very bottom, so Medigap plans, they cover Medicare covered services, but there is an exception, and that's care received outside of the US. So all of the Supplement 1 plans will add in worldwide coverage, even though Medicare doesn't cover you out of the US. And some carriers also added in on the core plans. We don't have the check mark there because we're just trying to show you this, what the state requires. So one thing that's very nice about Medigap plans in Massachusetts is we have something called continuous open enrollment. So as long as you meet the eligibility, which usually is you live in Massachusetts and you have Medicare Parts A and B, you can sign up on these plans month to month to month. There's continuous enrollment. We take applications throughout the year. And that's really flexible because in some other states, if you don't sign up on a Medigap plan within the first six months of going on Medicare, you have to wait for the open enrollment period. So you can't do it any time. In Massachusetts, any time you can sign up on these plans. Do some of the Medigap plans in Massachusetts, do they competitively price themselves by maybe removing that worldwide coverage? So how do we compete from a price standpoint? Well, I have to say that these benefits, these check marks are showing mandated benefits from the Massachusetts Division of Insurance. So when you look at the different Medigap carriers, we are all selling the same two plans. And one plan might be 182 or 3, and one plan might be 195, and it's the same plan. 
but there is a way we can differentiate ourselves a little bit. So for one way, you might see plans added worldwide on the core. It's not checked off here because we're not required to, but some companies do. Another thing a company might do is add in some things that are not covered by Medicare A and B. So you might see um, money towards your fitness, money back towards your gym membership, or money towards Weight Watchers, or um, a discount program if you sign up when you first go on to Medicare, things like that. So that's how we can differentiate ourselves a little bit. But these benefits, the Medicare A and B, we really can't tweak those. Okay, so let's talk about Medicare Part D. If you need prescription drug coverage and you are on Medicare, the way to get that coverage is by uh, obtaining Part D prescription drug benefits. You can either buy a standalone Part D plan, and that's what you would have to do if you have Medigap, because Medigap plans don't come with drug coverage in the individual market. So if that's your choice, you have to go out and shop for a Part D plan which is a standalone insurance policy just to pay for your medicine. After this, though, we'll talk about Medicare Advantage. If you buy one of those plans, you might get the Part D built right into that plan. But in any case, Part D is prescription drug insurance. It's offered by private insurance companies. Part D plans cover brand name and generic medications uh, through pharmacy networks. So you might have heard names like Express Scripts and CVS Caremark. And so these are the companies that will dispense your medication. You can go down to a retail pharmacy, a local pharmacy. There's usually mail order available. Um, you pay a monthly premium to have a Part D plan when you buy a standalone drug plan. Now, it's harder for me to give a range here because there are over 20 Part D plans in the market right now. So there's a lot of choice that you have. Um, the lowest plan I know about is about 20 bucks, $20 a month, and then the plans are way up over 100. Nationally, Part D plans average $35 this year, and I think in Massachusetts, more like $40, $40 a month. So choosing the right Part D plan this will probably take you the most time when you're making your insurance decisions. Um, there's information out there, medicare.gov, the website has a way to help you. SHINE is a program, I can't say enough about this program, it is under the Office of Elder Affairs. It stands for Serving Health Information Needs of Everyone on Medicare, so it's much easier to say SHINE. A SHINE counselor is a volunteer and they get monthly training on all of this insurance and that is a free advocacy service for you. So if you're trying to figure out, wow, which insurance do I need, which drug plan is the best one for me, a SHINE counselor you can sit down with one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, Barry is here every Monday. You make an appointment, it's a private appointment, and it's for one hour, and that is a free service for you all. So that is wonderful that you have that available to you. Now one more thing about Part D. So Part D pays for prescriptions, and at the very bottom, join when first eligible to avoid a potential late enrollment penalty. This is important, I want you to understand this. Part D is not mandatory. Nobody says you have to take a Part D plan, but there's a reason you want to consider it. And that is that if you don't take a drug plan when you're first eligible, and you don't have any other creditable drug coverage, like employer coverage, or you're not a veteran, and you can't go to the VA for your medicines, you just don't take a plan. Later on down the line, if you sign up for a plan, the federal government has been calculating for every month that you waited a monthly penalty. So they want you to sign up for Part D when you're first <coughs> eligible. And if you don't, then they'll impose the penalty. The penalty this year is 1% of the national average drug plan. So I, I said that was $35 about. So 1% is 35 cents. So that's for a month, for every month that you delay, but it's cumulative. So let's say I personally delayed 10 months and then I bought a drug plan after my initial eligibility. I would have a $3.50 penalty added on to the premium of the plan that I buy every month forever. So that's why I want you to understand the penalty. Who might not face this penalty? 
um, someone who continues to work past age 65 that maintains employer coverage, as long as that prescription coverage in the employer plan is at least as good as Part D, and I'm going to show you what Part D looks like in a moment, that's called creditable drug coverage, you wouldn't have a penalty. Many veterans can go to the VA facilities to get their medications. That's usually creditable drug coverage. You can ask whoever's covering you for your prescriptions, is this creditable in the eyes of Medicare? They will tell you, and Barry here can help you with that as well. Part D plans, I mentioned that there's so many of them out there. And there's, what's different between them all are <coughs> premiums can be different, co-pays can be different, but there's something that's true or the same for all Part D plans, and that is that we are following three levels of coverage that the federal government has put in place. So we're contracted with Medicare, and Medicare every year gives us these love coverage levels, and we have to follow those. So this year, in 2016, the first coverage level for all Part D plans is called initial coverage, and it's $3,310. So anybody you know that has a Part D plan, on January 1, they started out with $3,310 to spend on their medicine for this whole year. Now, while you fill prescriptions as a member on a drug plan, you have to pay something towards your medicine. And what you pay could be a co-payment, it could be a co-insurance, which is a percent of the cost of the plan. You could even have a deductible. Plans are allowed to have deductibles this year up to $360. Never more, but up to that amount. If you have a deductible on your plan, you'd have to pay that first for, before your coverage starts. Now, so you go to fill your prescription at the pharmacy, you have $3,310 to work with this year, but when you fill your prescription, you're asked to pay something. Whatever your plan says, you have to pay. I wanna explain what's happening to the initial coverage. So you pay your portion, and then the insurance plan is paying the other amount. Those two amounts together equal the total retail cost of your drug, and that's being deducted from that initial coverage. So let me, let me give an example. So let's say in January, I go to the pharmacy, and the pharmacist says, Heather, that's $25 copayment. So I pay my copayment, I take my medicine home, and when I get home, I look at my receipt and I see it says patient paid 25, insurance paid 75. This is just an example. So the total amount of my drug in that case is $100. That 100 has been deducted from my initial coverage, 3,310. Now I have 3,210. And the next month I do the same thing. February, I walk in, I pay 25, plan pays 75. 100 comes out of my 3,210, now I have 3,110. Do you see how that works? The plans are required to send you statements. So you're not trying to figure this out with your calculator and your receipts. The plans will send you monthly statements so you know what's going on. And member service, customer service at any plan you're on will always be responsible to answer your questions. But as you fill prescriptions, you're debiting down that initial amount of coverage. Now for some people, that's enough for the whole year, and every January you start with a new amount. But for some people, unfortunately, they might have expensive medicines, they might go through that 3310, then they go into level two, which is called the coverage gap. Do you remember what they used to call that? The donut hole. The donut hole, you got it. Have you heard of that? The donut hole. That's officially known as the coverage gap, but they used to call it the donut hole. In the coverage gap, you're buying your medicine now, but you're getting discounted prices. You'll pay 58% of the cost towards generic drugs, 45% of the cost towards brand name drugs, excluding any dispensing fee. So let's say I'm in the gap, I've used my 3310, I'm now in the gap and I'm buying a $100 brand drug, I'm gonna pay $45 to take that medication home. 
If the year ends, I start the next January with a new initial coverage. And every year, the federal government resets that amount. This year, it went up almost $300. So you're in the coverage gap. Your personal expenses are being added up, too. The, the federal government wants to make sure you don't spend more than a certain amount. It's a big amount, but if your yearly out-of-pocket costs hit $4,850, and you are not done with the year, and you're still filling prescriptions, that would push you into level three, known as catastrophic drug coverage. In catastrophic coverage, your plan is gonna take over and pay for your medicines again, and you're gonna pay, you can see these smaller amounts, you're gonna pay either small co-pays, or if you have expensive drugs, you'll pay 5%, and your plan will pay 95%. So what's coming out of the initial coverage is the total retail cost of a medication, which is made up of your portion and the insurance carrier's portion combined. If you look at Part D plans, you might be able to save some money using mail order, because you can usually save money on co-pays and things like that and get a 90-day supply set right to your home. Some Medicare Part D plans do not cover psychotropic medications, but that brings me to the formulary. Every Part D plan uses what's called a formulary to cover its medications. A formulary is a list. It's just a list of drugs that that plan covers. And each company's formulary can be slightly different. So that's why it's a good idea before you pick a Part D plan to look at the formulary, especially if you're taking medications, you want to know how that plan covers you. And if there's something that you take that's not covered by that plan, you might want to move on and look at, a, look at another plan. So remember in the beginning we talked about the, the slide with the boxes where you can do Medicare, Medigap, Part D, the three separate coverages, three cards in your wallet? We've covered that. Now we're moving over to the right. We're going to talk about buying that all-in-one plan known as Medicare Advantage. And there are a lot of those plans around. They're also known as Medicare Part C. You can really, if, if your budget is what's driving you, you can really bring your premium down by purchasing a Medicare Advantage plan and get a lot of good benefits. A Medicare Advantage plan is sold by a private insurance carrier that has a contract with Medicare, which is a branch of the federal government. That contract is renewed annually, and that company, um, so that company contracts with Medicare, and then they're allowed to go out and sell their Medicare Advantage plans. Now, these plans usually use networks of providers, especially if you're in an HMO. You are going to be within a network, so you're going to want to know if your primary doctor's in the plan, if your specialist's in the plan. You're going to be mindful of the network, because with HMOs, you usually have to stay in the network for your care, you're covered out of the network, usually for just urgent and emergency type services. Um, there are PPO plans as well, but we pay the companies, the Medicare Advantage companies, they pay the providers in their network, and Advantage plans will add in additional benefits. So you get all your Medicare A and B, but you get some extra benefits with these plans. Members pay premiums, and pay cost sharing. So these plans, you might get your premium down quite low on these plans, but you have cost sharing similar to the plans you have while you're working, like when you have an office visit co-payment and a specialist co-payment. I call these pay-as-you-go plans. So you pay something when you use services. And, and members also have to follow plan rules. An example of a rule might be uh, if you have an HMO, you need referrals to see specialists, as an example. A little more information on Medicare Advantage. So these plans, let's say you find a nice plan that you like, a Medicare HMO or a PPO, you're going to pay a monthly premium for that. Ranges, uh, that's harder because there's so many plans out there. There are zero premium plans out there. And you might say, how can a company charge nothing for a plan? Remember I just told you how we contract with Medicare? We're federally funded. We get a monthly payment for every member who joins our plan. So if you sign up with us, we let Medicare know, and they give us money to take over and be responsible for all your medical bills. 
So that's why the premiums can be low or even zero. So typical plans out there, I would say usually the plans charge at least 30 to $100 is a good premium for a Medicare Advantage plan. But there, there are higher premiums and there are lower premiums, like zero premium. The lower the premium you go, the more out-of-pocket costs you're going to have, and vice versa. So with Advantage plans, you will always have your original Medicare Part A and B benefits. You don't give up anything. Everything that's in original Medicare is in these plans. You also will have some extra benefits. So these tend to be preventive, and these are things Medicare doesn't cover. So uh, you'll see a routine vision exam added in, routine hearing exam. You'll see plans offer preventive dental, so a couple cleanings a year, bite wing x-rays. You'll see money towards gym memberships, maybe money towards glasses or hearing aids. You have to look plan by plan at these, I call these bells and whistles. These are like the extra things that we, that we add in. HMO plans, Health Maintenance Organization is what that stands for. You choose a PCP, a primary care provider. You usually need referrals within the network to see specialists. You're going to pay cost sharing to serve towards services. PPO plans, Preferred Provider Organization is what that stands for. PPO plans have in and out of network coverage. So a lot of people these days we're noticing are interested in PPOs because they're not stuck in that network. They can see network providers, but if they want to go out of network, they can, um, and they have coverage. Also, PPO plans do not require referrals, so some people don't you know, like that, that they don't have to get referrals. Advantage plans will always provide worldwide coverage for urgent and emergency care. Um, if you find an Advantage plan that includes Medicare Part D drug coverage, you're not going to pay a separate premium for Part D, but it's still going to be that plan design that we just talked about because the federal government regulates that. So even if you have an HMO or PPO with drug coverage, it's still going to have that initial coverage, the coverage gap, and the catastrophic coverage. We have to follow that. One last point that I think is important about Advantage plans. So I said that you cost share, you pay as you go. You might have an office visit copay, money towards hospitalization, maybe you pay something towards an x-ray. There is a cap on your cost sharing with a, a Medicare Advantage plan. It's called your total out-of-pocket maximum. And any Advantage plan you look at, make sure you're familiar with that figure because that is your worst case scenario. So don't be too dazzled by the low premium. You want to look at that total out-of-pocket maximum because that is your exposure, if you will. That's what you could be on the hook for. Typical total out-of-pocket maximums, 3,400, 4,900, but when you get into the PPOs within and out of network coverage, I've seen as much as 10,000. So you want to know that number. And the Medicare.gov website sets it up that way. So if you look there, it'll say the premium and the total out-of-pocket maximum right together. So page 15, this is just a resource slide. I won't read everything to you, but it's for your information. It's a takeaway. We've given you here the number and the website for Medicare, for Social Security. In our state, the SHINE program, I told you about that. You've got Barry Olewski here on Mondays. Uh, at the Revere Senior Center, but there's an 800 number as well if you need to make a quick phone call. Mass Medline is a pharmacy outreach program. Down at the bottom, Prescription Advantage. Remember I said if Part D looks daunting to you and you're worried about your out-of-pocket costs, there are programs that can help you? Well, there's, there's a program that's run by the federal government. It's not on my slide, but it's called Extra Help, and Barry would know about that. You can apply for that if you're worried about drug costs. This is a means-tested program, so you do have to demonstrate a need and show income and assets. Prescription Advantage, this is a Massachusetts program that is not a low-income program. Anybody can apply for it. Um, and where you get some assistance is in the donut hole or in the coverage gap. Um, you, you do have to give them some income-related information 
because I think there's a sliding scale of assistance, but it's not a low-income program. When you're initially eligible for Medicare, that first time you go into Medicare, you can sign up for any of the plans we've talked about. And in our state of Massachusetts, you can sign up for Medigap month to month to month, continuous enrollment. But Part D and Medicare Advantage are federal regulated plans and that we follow federal enrollment rules. So what that means is you can't sign up at any time and you can't move around at any time. So if you sign up for a plan and you want to change your drug plan or your Medicare Advantage plan after your initial election period, the next time you can do it is in the fall every year. That's called the annual election period. We also call it Medicare open enrollment. It's from October 15th to December 7th every year. And any change you make to your health plan, you can change everything at that time. Between October 15th and December 7th, you can change your drug plan, you can change your health plan, you can do whatever you want. The change will happen on January 1st. Now, the next box over, MADP, disenrollment, what does that mean? Medicare Advantage disenrollment period uh, that was just created a few years ago. If someone is on an Advantage plan and they're not, um, it's not working out for them, you can disenroll during this period, which is January 1 to February 14th. You can't get another Advantage plan, but you can get off and you go back onto original Medicare. To the far right, special enrollments. Some people are able to change their plans because they fall into a special enrollment that Medicare recognizes. An example, you move to a, a new service area. Maybe you move out of state. That would create a special enrollment. You let go of employer coverage. You've been on Part A of Medicare for five years, and now you're 70 and you're going to retire and pick up Part B. That creates a special enrollment. So these are just some examples. But these are the general enrollment periods. Heather mentioned the election period, October 15th to December 7th, where you can elect to change your coverage for Medicare, which is effective January 1st January of the following year. Yep. We heavily advertise that in the newspapers, in our newsletter, on Revere Cable TV. And Barry and Irene O'Donnell, who you probably know as well, we usually have two people working upstairs on Mondays, every Monday. Uh, to take care of the numbers that come in here because a lot of people do change their coverage. So I just wanted to make that point. I won't go through this whole slide, but slide 17 has to do with high income. Just for your information, I gave you the standard premiums for Medicare Part B, but when people fall into high income brackets, Social Security would notify them that they're going to have to pay more for Part B. And these are the income thresholds this year in 2016, and Social Security determines those. So someone who falls into high income, and MAGI stands for Modified Adjusted Gross Income. Somebody who falls into this income bracket that's a higher one, they're going to pay more for Part B, and there's also going to be another charge added on to their Part D drug plan. What are your health options if you retire, you let go of employer coverage, and you haven't reached reach that magical age of 65 where you get Medicare. You can, if you have a spouse or a partner who is working, you can move over to their coverage because when you lose coverage, that's considered a qualifying event. So if your spouse is working and they have benefits, you can usually move over and become a covered dependent on their plan. You could also consider taking COBRA from where you work. You could they will, by law, offer you COBRA continued coverage. That's an option. And another option to the far right is to buy direct pay coverage. That's by purchasing insurance directly through a carrier or through our state's exchange, which is the Commonwealth, the Health Connector. So the things you're considering are um, the providers that you can see, the, the benefit design, like how are you covered, what are your benefits, and for most people it's cost. How much is it going to cost to do any of these arrangements? So let's take a look at spouse or partner coverage. So if you drop your coverage, you will probably, probably be able to get on your spouse's plan if that's available to you. Check with their employer and make sure that they will that they consider that uh, a qualifying event and you can come onto their plan. 
You want to take a look at your spouse's coverage. They might have a very different plan than you, so you want to look and see how it works if your doctors are in it. And also, your spouse pays something out of their paycheck at work for coverage. You want to know what's going to happen with that if you come on the plan. It's, it, if it doesn't double, it's probably going to get close to that to bring you on as another dependent. So that's one option that you have. If that's not available, or that's not a good option, you can take the COBRA that's available and offered to you by your company where you were working. When you leave employment, you're usually eligible for COBRA for up to 18 months. Sometimes dependents are eligible for COBRA longer, up to 36 months, and that's usually that depends on the qualifying event. Letting go of employment is 18 months, but sometimes dependents can see that COBRA lasts for 36 months in the cases of divorce, legal separation, or death. You want to verify that you're eligible for COBRA. You're familiar with that plan. That's the insurance you've had at work. What you might not be familiar with is how generous your employer was and how much they've been paying to have you on it. And now that's your dime. So that COBRA premium, that premium your company's been paying for you is now something that you have to assume 100%. There might even be a one or 2% administrative fee added onto that to keep you in COBRA. But I meet a lot of people at my meetings who come to hear about the Medicare plans and they've stopped working and they've got like three months until they go out to Medicare. And so sometimes they choose to just pay COBRA for a couple of months at work until they go on to Medicare. The last option, but not least, is to buy a direct pay plan. I meet people who do this too. Sometimes COBRA can be very high and they didn't know how much their employers were paying. You can also look at buying a direct pay plan. And Letting go of employer coverage is a qualifying event, so you should be able to buy direct pay. And you can buy direct pay plans as individual plans, as two-person plans, and in full family plans. So these are before Medicare plans, so you can see two-person and family coverage. Um, you're gonna be paying that premium, and you can go directly to an insurance company and, and say, I want to buy a direct pay plan, but you can also go through our state's exchange. And I believe most of the states now in the, in the country have exchanges, but we've had the connector here since 2006 or seven. Our state's exchange is called the Massachusetts Health Connector, and there's a, a, an 800 toll-free number there for you. There's also a website. The connector can give you quotes on the phone if you just want to know how much would it cost for me and my spouse or me alone to buy a direct pay plan. Um, you can do that on their website or they can give you a quote over the telephone. There are also, um, you have to in this case provide some income information but the connector sells no cost and subsidized plans if you meet certain income guidelines. Um, so the connector buying a direct pay plan is another option that you have if you don't want to move if you can't move to a spouse's coverage or you don't want to cobra is too expensive buying a direct pay plan is another way to go until you reach medicare eligibility was this helpful yeah.